There have been quite a few examples in our industry over the years of developers and publishers trying to capitalize on the success of their games or properties, but failing to do so with sequels. These sequels don't necessarily have to be bad games per se, though they often are, and can be perfectly decent in their own right, but by and large fail to match up to the heights that their predecessors reached. In this feature, we'll look at 15 such sequels. Back for more. Mass Effect Andromeda No one needs to be told about the massive legacy of the original Mass Effect trilogy. Barring some missteps here and there, BioWare's first three Mass Effect games are collectively probably the best work they've ever done. Then there's Mass Effect Andromeda, which is not. To be fair, Andromeda is a good game in its own right, and it certainly has a lot going for it, but it just doesn't do justice to the magic of its predecessors. Even if we ignore the overblown criticisms the game was subject to at the time of its launch, we still have to accept that Andromeda is a pretty big step back from the Commander Shepard trilogy. Crackdown 3 The Crackdown series has always hinted at having great potential, but never quite managed to live up to it. With Crackdown 3, Microsoft were promising to touch the heights that they thought the series had always been capable of touching, and then some. What the game did was the exact opposite. Crackdown 3 is a bland, unoriginal, unenjoyable game that not only feels much worse than its predecessor, but just feels like a downright mediocre game at best, and downright bad at worst. Mirror's Edge Catalyst Mirror's Edge Catalyst deserved credit for a few things. It deserves credit for the excellent way it built on the parkour of its predecessor, and how it married that with excellent open world design. It also deserves credit for its stunning visuals and art design, but the game faltered with much else beyond that. The story was inconsistent, the melee combat was a clunky mess, and mindless and boring side content actively took away from the game's open world setting. The first Mirror's Edge was an underrated gem that could have been elevated by a great sequel. It deserved something much better than Catalyst. Star Wars The Force Unleashed 2 The Force Unleashed remains probably one of the most beloved Star Wars games in the last couple of decades, and LucasArts had the incredible opportunity to deliver something truly memorable with a sequel. The Force Unleashed 2, however, failed spectacularly. Sure, the game benefited from some excellent visuals at the time, while the combat's fusion of lightsaber duels and force powers could be quite fun, but with a disappointingly bad story and a by-the-numbers approach to other areas, it just felt like a very unnecessary and uninspired sequel. Dragon Age 2 With Dragon Age Origins, Bioware delivered a CRPG experience at a time when they were becoming increasingly rare. With Dragon Age 2, they sort of just forgot about everything Dropping the tactical, complex, and ridiculously deep nature of Origins, with the sequel they went for something that was more streamlined, more action-oriented, and more immediate. Duke Nukem Forever Duke Nukem Forever was technically in development for over a decade, and it spent much of that time in development hell. Its hellish existence did not end when it finally launched though, because as we all know, it turned out to be an absolute dumpster fire. Outdatedly crass humor, aged game design and mechanics, horribly clunky controls, and a litany of technical issues proved to collectively be the final nail in the coffin for not only this game, but for the entire Duke Nukem franchise. Ninja Gaiden 3 Team Ninja's revival of the Ninja Gaiden series is perhaps one of the most successful examples of how to revive and reimagine a beloved property, and with the first two games in the rebooted series, they delivered what are probably two of the greatest character action games of all time. With Ninja Gaiden 3, it's fair to say that they definitely did not do that. Ninja Gaiden 3 made the mistake that so many other games used to make in the late PS3 and Xbox 360 era. In a misguided effort to appeal to larger audiences, it sacrificed the hardcore depth of its predecessors for what was a much shallower experience. In the end, Ninja Gaiden 3 did not know why so many people fell in love with its predecessors, and it suffered for that. Driver 3 what a complete mess this game was. In a bid to capitalize on the growing popularity of the sandbox open world formula of the Grand Theft Auto series, Driver 3 decided to ape and mimic rather than stick to its guns and deliver something unique. As a result, not only did it fail to be a good driver game, it also failed to be a good GTA clone. Thanks to broken physics, numerous technical issues, boring combat, stiff controls, and a host of other issues, Driver 3 is, without a shadow of a doubt, the worst game in the series. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword 
Even a disappointing mainline Zelda installment is better than most other games out there. And though that's true for Skyward Sword as well, this was still the lowest point for the series in a long, long time. Skyward Sword was ridiculously linear, and it refused to let go of the player's hands, to the point that it almost felt like an on-rails game at times, which is the exact opposite of how you want a Zelda game to feel. If not for the widespread criticism Skyward Sword received for these issues, Nintendo would have never made Breath of the Wild in response, so at least something good did come of it. Dead Space 3 Let's be completely clear, Dead Space 3 is definitely not a bad game. It is more than worth a playthrough if you're a fan of the series. But is it a worthwhile sequel to Dead Space 1 and 2, two of the best horror games ever made? Well, probably not. It seems like every major horror franchise goes through a period where it decides to lean more heavily into large-scale action tropes, and Dead Space 3 was that moment. And even though it did deliver some pretty good action moments, to do that it had to sacrifice the excellent horror approach of its predecessors. Dynasty Warriors 9 Even with the improvements brought by an overhauled combo system and the introduction of an open world, Dynasty Warriors 9 was still largely the same as previous entries. It's not particularly engrossing, and it feels as though it only wants longtime fans to play it. If you didn't love the franchise from the beginning, you won't find much to love here either. It's fun if you want to just button mash all day in pure Dynasty Warriors style, but other than that, the somewhat empty world, bad camera, and frame rate make this new entry rather mediocre. Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts during the N64 era, Rare delivered two of the most beloved high-quality 3D platformers we've seen to this day with Banjo-Kazooie and its sequel. When they decided to return to the series under Microsoft after a long hiatus, expectations were high. Sadly, Nuts and Bolts turned out to be a major disappointment. It deserves props for trying to innovate, sure, but it innovated so much that it completely lost sight of what it should and could have been. Rather than making another excellent 3D platformer, Rare decided to deliver a game that was focused on… vehicle construction? And sure, in isolation, Nuts and Bolts could be a lot of fun, but this was definitely not what Banjo-Kazooie fans wanted the series' comeback to be. Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite This generation has seen Capcom stumbling quite a bit with its biggest fighting franchises, and that stands true for Marvel vs. Capcom as well. To their credit, they did some interesting things with it, managing to strike the right balance between simplification and depth. Mechanically, Infinite has a lot to love, but at the same time the game got several things wrong. The biggest issue was its lean and disappointing roster, which for some reason completely ignored X-Men and Fantastic Four characters, while the game also looked much worse than its predecessors. If Capcom ever makes another Versus game, hopefully they'll keep the gameplay improvements of Infinite, but also improve upon its biggest deficiencies. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 If ever you want to give just one example of an atrociously terrible game in a beloved franchise, look no further than Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5. This game absolutely did not need to exist. And sure, that's easier to say with the benefit of hindsight, but no, seriously, this was barely even a game. Other than the few rare moments when it somehow managed to exploit nostalgia, Pro Skater 5 had very, very little going for it. Poor design? Check. Horrible, unresponsive controls? Check. An absolute ocean of technical issues from choppy frame rate to a ton of bugs and glitches? Double check. Here's hoping the upcoming Tony Hawk 1 and 2 remakes are better at reminding us why we all loved this series so much in the first place. Resident Evil 6 The poster boy of a horror franchise that no longer wants to be horror in a misguided attempt to appeal to wider audiences. But here's the funny thing. Resident Evil 5, and to a lesser extent 4, already did that, and did it so much better. The problem with RE6 wasn't just that it was almost completely lacking in horror elements, which it was, it was that it was a dumb, explosion-y game with a ridiculous highway explosion, a stupid helicopter bike chase, an off-brand nemesis, and the worst villain in the history of the series who at one point turned into a dinosaur. No, we do not want any of this in our Resident Evil games. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.